If three frogs catch three flies in three seconds, how long will it take ten frogs to catch ten flies? Are you sure? Watch. Some riddles are easy. Others require more thinking. And a few rules. The first rule is to look at the whole problem carefully before attempting to get the answer. A magician often focuses the audience's attention on something that has nothing to do with his trick. Here's a good example. The Polar Bear Express runs north from Cochrane, Ontario to Moosonee on James Bay. Thirty passengers get on at Cochrane. The train passes by Island Falls and stops at Fraserdale where eight people get off. And three people get on. The train passes through Coral, Onakawana, Moose River Crossing, and stops at Moosonee, where everyone gets off. Question. Which town is nearer to Cochrane? Onakawana or Coral? If you know at the beginning what you're trying to find out, you won't get sidetracked by useless details. The second rule is to make sure you see the question clearly. Is seeing really believing? Which line is longer? Can you ever reach the top of these stairs? As you can see, things are not always what they look like. What do you see here? And here? And here? Different people can see the same things differently. The third rule is to draw a diagram to illustrate the problem to be solved. A snail starts at the bottom of a well, 16 feet deep. Each day he crawls up four feet. But each night he slips back three feet. So he advances one foot each day. How many days will it take the snail to reach the top of the well? It seems like an easy problem, but remember our three rules. Look at the whole problem, see it clearly, draw a diagram. The well is 16 feet deep. Let's trace his progress day by day. So, the snail reaches the top of the well at the end of the 13th day. Now that you've learned some basic rules, let's do some puzzles involving clear thinking or logic. These 10 snooker balls form a triangle. Can you reverse the direction of the triangle by moving just three balls? Right. Can you change this to this? By moving only two walking sticks and not touching the top hat? Be careful that you don't turn a simple problem into a hard one by insisting on rules which no one said you had to follow. This problem has tricked quite a few people. Suppose you invited three of your friends to a clam bake after school. You have a dozen clams. What would be a fair portion for each person? Don't you want some too? After the party, there were three full glasses of lemonade and three empty glasses. What's the least number of glasses you have to move to end up with this? Why not do this? A sailor noticed as he went ashore that there were 22 rungs of the ship's ladder above the water. The rungs are one foot apart and the tide rises four feet overnight. 
how many rungs will be above water when the sailor returns next morning? That didn't fool all of you, did it? Which weighs more, a pound of feathers or a pound of gold? When can you add two to eleven and get one as the correct answer? Everyone knows a piece of paper has two sides. To get from one side to the other, you must cross over an edge at some point. But, is it possible to have a piece of paper with only one side? Now you can draw a line clear around the paper, returning to the starting point, without crossing an edge. So this piece of paper has only one side. What do you think will happen if you cut all the way around, following the line? That's an unusual example, with unusual logic. Sometimes it's important to recognize patterns of logic, to find out what rule is being followed. This is called inductive thinking, or following a pattern. What comes next? Right. Although no one told you what rule to follow, it's pretty obvious. What rule is being followed here? Obviously, the next number is 44. You can use inductive thinking to solve lots of problems. Suppose a burglar breaks into a house to steal a pair of socks. He opens a drawer and finds that it's filled with white socks and black socks. Just as he's about to reach in and grab a pair, his flashlight goes out. And he's left in total darkness. What is the least number of socks he would have to take to make sure he had one matching pair? Let's see. Suppose he picked two socks. He could have a pair that matched. But he could also have one of each. But if he picks a third sock, it's bound to match one or the other of the first two socks. What's the least number of socks he would have to take to make sure he had two matching pairs? You should be able to use inductive thinking to get the answer. One very important way of deciding whether a statement is true or false is the method of deductive thinking. If a whooping crane is bigger than a giant Canada goose, and a giant Canada goose is bigger than a loon. Is it true that a whooping crane is bigger than a loon? If there are more than 12 students in your math class, at least two have their birthdays in the same month. True or false? In both cases, you were given some information and asked to form a conclusion. In the first case, all the information was given. In the second case, you had to call on your memory for additional facts. Deductive thinking can be based on given facts, or facts assumed to be true. Recently, an Italian farmer found an ancient coin while plowing his fields near Rome. But he cleaned it up and took it to a coin dealer, who said it was old, but counterfeit. Look at the coin carefully. Can it be genuine, or must it be counterfeit? Look at the date, 45 B.C., 45 years before the birth of Christ. How could they know? A man is waiting for the train to Thunder Bay. He sees a tunnel down the track, but he's afraid of the dark. Where should he sit on the train to spend the shortest time in the tunnel? The train begins moving. It picks up speed. By the time the caboose arrives at the tunnel, it will be going faster than the engine was when it entered the tunnel. And now we know where we should sit. Sometimes the conclusion you form is not true, even though the deductive thinking you did was correct. Fred and Alf are chimney sweeps. At the end of the day, they look like this.
which one will wash his face? Suppose you're Alf. You see Fred's clean face. And you figure yours must be clean too, so there's no need to wash up. Suppose you're Fred. You see Alf's dirty face, and you figure yours must be dirty too. So you go and wash up. So deductive thinking doesn't always lead to the correct conclusions. Logical thinking can provide shortcuts. One of these five gold pieces is counterfeit and weighs less than the rest. Can you find the counterfeit coin with only two weighings on the balance scale? First, let's balance any two pieces against any other two. If the scales balance, then these four coins are genuine, and the remaining coin is counterfeit. If the scales don't balance, weigh the coins in the lighter pan against each other to show which is counterfeit. Here's a question, and we're not going to give you the answer, so listen carefully. Late one night, three men enter a hotel. The hotel keeper charges them $10 each, or $30 in all to share a room. Then, after some thinking, the hotel keeper decides that he's overcharged them. So he gives the bellboy $5 to return to them. The bellboy, unable to divide $5 into three equal parts, pockets $2 for himself and returns only $1 to each man. That means that the room cost each man $9, or $27 in all. If we add to this the $2 the bellboy kept, we get a total of $29. Yet the men paid $30 for the room. If you remember the rules and think clearly, you should be able to find out what happened to the other dollar. Let's see how good a detective you are. 